Lesson 1 on Renunciation In the beginning, when God created man, he put him in paradise, and as the Holy Scripture says, having adorned him with every virtue, commanded him not to eat from the tree in the middle of paradise. He was in the luxury of paradise, in prayer, in the vision of God, in all glory and honor, having sound perception and being in his natural state, just as he was created. For God created him after his own image, that is to say, immortal, with free will, and adorned with every virtue. However, when he disobeyed God and ate from the tree which God had forbidden him to eat from, he was then expelled from paradise. He fell from his natural state into a state contrary to nature, that is to say, into sin, into ambition, and the love of the pleasures of this life and all the other passions, and was dominated by them, and became subject to them because of his transgression. Thus, in turn, evil increased and death reigned. Godliness was no more, and ignorance of God was everywhere. Only a few, as the father said, knew God, moved by natural law. Such were Abraham and the other patriarchs, Noah and Job. Simply put, those who knew God were very few and very rare. The enemy unfolded all his wickedness then, and sin reigned. And it was from then that idolatry, polytheism, magic, murders, and the rest of a devil's evil started. Then God, who is good, had mercy on his creature, and gave him the written law through Moses, where some things were forbidden and others were permitted saying, You shall do this, and you shall not do that. He gave commandments and says directly, The Lord your God is one Lord. He said that in order to avert a person's mind from polytheism. He also said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul and with all your mind. Everywhere he proclaims that God is one, and there is no other God but Him. For when He said, You shall love the Lord your God, He has shown that there is one God and one Lord. Again, in the Ten Commandments it is written, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, and shall take oaths in His name. He then adds, You shall have no other gods before Me, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, because they worship all creatures. Therefore, God, who is good, gave the law for help, for a return, and for the correction of evil. However, evil was not corrected. He sent prophets, but they were also unable to correct evil. For evil prevailed, as Isaiah says, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. We could say that evil is not in one part nor in one place, but throughout the entire body. It contains the person's whole soul, it constrains all its powers. There is no ointment to put on it, and so on, as if he wanted to say that everything was under the domination of sin, everything was ruled by it. Jeremiah also says, We tried to heal Babylon, but she was not healed. That is to say, we have revealed your name, we have proclaimed your commandments, your benefactions, your promises. We have foretold the rebellions of Babylon's enemies, and in spite of this, Babylon was not healed. In other words, it has not repented, it has not been afraid, it has not returned from its sinfulness. As he says elsewhere, they received no correction, that is to say, advice and teaching. Likewise, the Psalms say, Their soul abhorred all manner of food, 
and they drew near to the gates of death. Then God, who is good and loves mankind, sent his only begotten Son, because only God could heal man and enable him to rise up from this kind of suffering. This was not unknown to the prophets, and it was hence, as David clearly says, You who dwell between the Herubim shine forth, stir up your strength, and come and save us. Elsewhere, bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. There are many other sayings in the same vein. The other prophets proclaim the same message, each in his own way. Sometimes they entreated God to come down, and at others they already had been informed of his coming. Thus our Lord came down, becoming a man for our sakes, in order, as St. Gregory says, to heal like with like, the soul by the soul and the flesh by the flesh. He became a perfect man without sin. He has assumed our essence, the first fruit of our nature, and he became a new Adam, according to the image of him who created him. He renews human nature and makes our senses perfect again, as they were in the beginning. He renewed fallen man by becoming man. He liberated him from the domination of sin, which had compelled him by force. The enemy guided man by force, then, and tyranny. Moreover, as the Apostle points out, those who did not want to sin were almost forced to do so. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Therefore, having become man for our sake, God freed man from the tyranny of the enemy. For he destroyed all the devil's power, he has broken all his strength and delivered us from under his control, from slavery to him, unless we want to sin voluntarily. For he gave us power, as he said, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, since he has purified us from every sin through holy baptism. Through holy baptism, every sin is forgiven and erased. However, God, who is good, being aware of our sickness and knowing in advance that even after holy baptism we are going to sin again, as it is written that the imagination of man is intently bent upon evil things from his youth, has given us in his goodness holy commandments which purify us, so that if we should wish it, we can be purified again through observance of the commandments, not only from our sins, but also from our other passions. Sins are one thing and passions another. The passions are anger, idleness, desire for pleasure, hate, evil desire, and others. Sins, on the other hand, are the acting out of passions. That is to say, someone puts them into practice when he uses his body to enact everything dictated by the passions. It is expected for someone to have passions, but not to carry them out. Thus, as we have said, he gave us commandments which purify us even from our passions, from the evil disposition which is contained within us. He has endowed man with the ability to distinguish between good and evil. He wakes him up. He shows him the causes of sin, and he says to him, The law said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, you must not lust. The law said you shall not murder, but I say unto you, do not even be angry. If you have this lust, even if you do not commit adultery today, the desire inside you does not cease to tempt you until it makes you commit it. If you are angry and provocative towards your brother, you will soon fall into slander. Then you will want something bad to happen to him, so gradually you come to the point of murder. Again the law says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and so on, 
But the Lord advises us not only to accept the blow of him who strikes us with patience, but also to turn the other cheek to him in humility. At that time, the purpose of Allah was to teach us not to do those things which we do not want to suffer ourselves. It prevented us from doing evil because of fear of suffering the same. But now, as I said, what is asked of us is to expel this hatred, this desire for pleasure, this ambition, and the other passions. The aim of our Master Christ is simply to teach us how we came into all of these sins, how we fell into those evil days. First, as I have already said, He freed us through holy baptism, granting us forgiveness of sins. He gave us the power to do good if we wish, and not to be forcibly drawn, so to speak, to evil. For whoever is under the domination of sin is constrained and drawn by it. As it says, everyone is caught in the cords of his sins. Then, through the holy commandment, he teaches us how we can be purified from the passions, so that we will not fall into the same sins again. Thus, he shows us the cause of our disbane and disobedience to even this commandments of God. In this way, he gives us the cure for the cause, so that we shall be able to obey and be saved. What is the cure and what is the cause of this disbane? Hear what the Lord says, Learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Hear briefly in one word, He has shown us the root and cause of every evil, and the treatment for it, and also the cause of every good. He has shown us that arrogance defeated us, and that it is not possible to receive mercy other than through its opposite, humility. As arrogance produces contempt and destructive disobedience, so humility produces obedience and the salvation of our souls. I have real humility in mind, not that of words and external forms, but of a true humble disposition that is cultivated in the heart itself and within this mindset. This is what he means when he says, for I am gentle and lonely in heart. Therefore, whoever wants to find true rest in his soul must learn humility and he will see that all joy, all glory, and all true rest are to be found there, whilst in pride it is just the opposite. How have we come into all this affliction? How have we fallen into all this misery? Is it not because of our pride? Is it not because of our sensualness? Is it not because we took the wrong decision? Is it not because we chose to impose our bitter will? Why? Was not man created with every luxury, in all joy, in all rest, and in all glory? Was he not in paradise? God said, do not do that, but he did it. Do you realize the enormity of his pride? Do you see his obstinacy? Do you see his insubordination? Therefore, when he saw his impudence, God said, He is a fool, he does not know how to be happy. If he does not have a hard time, he will be totally lost. If he does not learn what sorrow is, he will not learn what rest is. Then he gave him what he deserved and expelled him from paradise. Thus, Man was given up to self-love and to his own desires which would crush his bones so as to learn not to trust himself but the commandment of God. The hardships from disobedience will teach him the calmness that comes from obedience as the prophet says, your own wickedness will correct you. However, as I said in many ways, the goodness of God has not renounced his creature but again invites and calls him, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is as if he is saying, You were laboring, you were miserable, you were suffering through your disobedience. Come then, return, recognize your weakness and your shame, so that you may attain your rest and glory. Come, lead a life of humility, you who were dead through haughtiness. Learn from me that I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your soul.